Welcome. I'm Pat Dewar, and this is a short uh, training on what's limiting your vision. And what it really amounts to is that in all of our lives, we go through uh, breaking, like uh, between the ages of 11 and say 14 years old. Uh, where would I get that that information? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I like to to say that uh, under pressure, adults are kids in big clothing. And why would I say that? Well, because they are. I mean, when uh, we were 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, we were in middle school, and that's when we decided to um, respond to pressure. If you think back to the way that the bully, uh, people that dealt with the bully, like the anybody that never backed down from the bully uh, in seventh, eighth grade, middle school, uh, how did they respond? Uh, how do they respond as an adult under pressure? They're, they're going to turn aggressive just like that. What about the ones that never took the mean girl or the mean guy on directly? What did they do? Well, um, back then they'd talk behind your back. Uh, as an adult, they'll plot your demise through your coworkers or CC everybody else up the food chain. I mean, the thing is, is that these are habits that have become unconscious autopilot levels of habits. The third group that typically run from conflict. What do I mean by that? Well, they've always run from conflict. As an adult, they'll run inside themselves and spew emotional link, lowering the emotional state and, and productivity of a team. Uh, these are the ones that when they get offended, they become such an energy suck that when they come into work in the morning, <laughs> lights dim as they pass. I mean, like, ow. But here's the, the, the basis of that. Many times in just about everybody's lives, I can't think I've never met somebody that didn't have some pressure in uh, the years between say nine and 14, where they were no longer um, the big kid. Maybe they were the new person. Maybe they were the, the freshman or the, the, the seventh grader or whatever it was that creates that uh, there are bigger people than me. There are more influential people than me. And so we begin to think that we're less than someone else in some areas. We buy what I call or lies. We buy limiting beliefs. Now, what I'd like to do today is give you a little information about how to process pain uh, rather than run from it. And, uh, and I, I can tell you, uh, just like anybody else out there that's been through some stuff, uh, I've learned some tools and I'm just trying to share them with you uh, as a, you know, my mission, my life uh, mission is that I am touching the nation, mentoring leaders to activate their power so they can create their destiny. And what that means to me is that I help people activate that pain that they've been through into power in their life. And so I encourage you to stick with me on this. I think you'll really enjoy this and it'll be a value to help you give you a process that when certain things are going on, you actually have a, a, a way to begin to work yourself out of it, to begin to a direction, a, a path to walk down. So why don't we go ahead and get started and, and um, to, to begin things off, um, I like to say your focus determines your reality. Um, I love Star Wars. I'm a nerd. Sorry about that. But uh, the fact is, is that many times what we focus on expands in our life. And if we've gone through some sort of breaking when we were younger, uh, many times it becomes a peg point, uh, a place of that we go back to over and over again in our life as we begin to um, experience things that kind of smell like or remind you of that event that occurred when you were much younger and, and how it can really dramatically affect your life. Uh, something as simple as a prank can make all the difference. Uh, and, and it can program you. It becomes a limiting belief. It becomes a, a way of responding that when certain people hit a hot button, you were, you run this program in your life. And so what I'm going to do is let me go ahead and walk you through. There's basically uh, three areas that we want to go through. And um, 
to start with, if you agree with me that everybody experiences pain, everybody experiences pain. And many times what we do with that pain is we create a seed out of it. And that seed becomes a tree, pain tree. That tree has a root system and a fruit system. Do you know people in your world that, uh, and have you ever seen in your own life, uh, areas where you'll have things like victim or depression or explosive behavior, denial, um, uh, de uh, internalization, codependent, any of these fruit of what I call unprocessed pain. If you see these in your work or in your family, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, guilt and shame are interesting because guilt can be good if it's, um, if it's, I feel guilty for something I did wrong. Uh, I stole a piece of candy and I felt guilty about it or whatever it might have been in your world. Uh, shame is that I feel bad about me, that I am bad. Um, guilt can be something that grows from within. Shame usually originates from outside of you. Someone says shame on you or they, they think that you've done a shameful thing. And so then it, when these fruit are grown up, they manifest in ways that are, are destructive and can hinder you in your career uh, big time. I mean, whatever it might be, um, these are the things that can, can hinder you. And, and I'll give you an example uh, as we go, you know, like when we look at the root system of this, there are anger, fear, and sadness are the primary um, emotions. They're dominant emotions. If you know someone that when they get angry, they stay angry for, you know, a day or two days or a week or hours and hours on end. They can't seem to get away from it. Um, there might be people in your world that have fear, panic attacks, uh, always afraid, always um, uh, in, in a state of kind of like um, fight or flight. And then, um, and then the third one is sadness. And sadness, you say hello to somebody or you say, how are you? And all of a sudden their, their eyes well up and the tears are right there behind their, their, you know, their lids. And, and it's just instantly they're feeling sad because it's become their dominant emotion. Well, what's interesting is that these feelings, these dominant feelings, the way that they get planted into our life is either an event or a series of events that occur many times in our teenage years. So um, anger, anger comes from an offense, an offense, okay? And um, let me show you what I'm talking about. If you look at expectations and realities, if they're too far apart, you're gonna see an emotional discharge, some sort of intense feeling showing up. And that is either coming at you or going from you at any moment, at any point in life, you're either feeling them or you're getting them. Okay. And so one of the things that you want to look at is, you know, how can I prove when expectations and reality are too far apart that you're going to have some sort of intense feeling or emotional discharge? Well, I mean, let me try to illustrate it this way. Can you think about, can you tell me, or could you tell me um, what you ate for lunch two weeks ago Tuesday? And if you can, it's Taco Tuesday, or I eat the same thing every day. So, or I eat the same thing every Tuesday, whatever it is for you. But expectation and reality two weeks ago Tuesday for lunch were about even. So there's no real need to remember it. But compare that lack of memory with this very definite memory. Can you tell me exactly where you were when you found out a second plane hit in New York City on 9-11? I can. I can tell you exactly where it was. I'm pretty certain you can too. I've taught this stuff uh, all over the country and over and over and over again. What I find is that everybody knows where they were. Uh, why? Because in that moment, we went from a la di da day to oblique. Or a war, emotional discharge. But it, it can show up in our world so easily, so easily that, um, I mean, road rage, 
somebody cuts you off in traffic, you know, do you, do they wave at you and say, Oh, you deserve that spot? Or do you wave at them and go, sorry about that? Or do you wave at them and call them number one in some other language? I mean, really it's, it's pretty important to look at where, where are these things that are going, are, are holding us back in our career. Because if you let an emotional discharge go at work, you can be perceived as unprofessional in your life. You can destroy relationships, your marriage, all of these things just because you don't control this. And so there are some keys to, to doing that. Um, I look at, you know, expectations. I don't, uh, you know, terror shouldn't blow buildings, but uh, they did uh, too far apart. Everybody remembers that date. You go into a, to a workshop, and uh, I teach classes on communication all over the country. And one of the things that I'll I'll say is, you know, maybe you came in here for master manipulation 504, but I tell you, it's a communication skills class with some heavy personal improvement overtones. And maybe that's too far apart, and a grenade goes off inside of them. Now all of a sudden they save that energy up. They come up to me and at the end of the day, just unload on me, Pat, how stupid can you be and still breathe and do this workshop this way at the top of their lungs. I mean, full on. And um, because what's happened is, is that they've gone in and they've taken such an offense that their mind has actually gone in, into what's called fight or flight. You see, our mind has an unconscious mind, five sixths of our mind, our conscious mind. That unconscious mind is like a beast, a, a huge Clydesdale horse or something. And it has reins. This, this thing actually has no reins and is untrained. And you're the rider. I mean, you're that thing that, that is on top of this beast. And if the beast wants to go left, you want to go right. You're going to go wherever the beast wants to go. It's 1800 pounds to however much you weigh. So the thing is, is that when we go into fight or flight, what happens is, is that, I mean, think about the words fight or flight. The blood is going out to our arms and our legs and is being drained from our brain. The mind literally shuts down the conscious mind and the unconscious mind rears up. But see, the unconscious mind, those programs that we run are in... The, that that seventh and eighth grade. And so reacting out of that offense or that pain. Well, whenever somebody goes off either on you or, and I'll even show you how you can use this for yourself. But if somebody goes off on me, you know, I just literally find a way to um, make a, a, a movement, maybe a pinch of my finger, or I'll drop my hand just slightly while I'm walking to them as a reminder of two things. One, quit taking it personally. Quit taking it personally. Number two is stop assuming it's all about you. Stop assuming it's all about you. It may have nothing to do with you. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. That's what they do. Hurt people hurt people. And so I just encourage you, you know, find a way to duck that emotional discharge and deal with the crater, deal with the issue, deal with the, the hurt rather than the discharge. And in essence, you want to really reframe that reality. Okay. Reframe that reality to what is rather than what should be. What is, is there in the seventh grade? What is, is that terror shouldn't blow up buildings, but they did. How do I reframe the reality? I look at what is, I look at what is up here, okay? And what is, is there are bad people out there willing to do bad things to Americans? Let's never give another chance. I mean, these are the things that are positive in, in, in recreating and taking that, that adult mind into those situations. And um, I mean, I look back at, in my own life, and um, uh, there was a, I mean, there was this one um, president of a company that I was working for. And I went out to this huge electronic show called the CES. And I'm visiting with a company, you might remember these guys, it was called Nokia. 
Well, at the time, Nokia was the largest manufacturer of cellular phones in the world. And I was really excited about being able to, to visit with their international leadership team in their booth that was massive. It was like, you know, three stories high and, you know, 60 or 80 feet across. And there were 100,000 people around us. And they were showing us and showing me a new device, a new Bluetooth headset or something. And I'm a nerd, so I'm asking them questions about it, like, you know, battery life, distance, frequency, stuff like that. And all of a sudden, the president of the company I'm working for comes barreling in from the side, screaming at the top of his lungs, why can't you think outside the epping box? No filters. And uh, I'm pretty certain that if that happened to you, that would have been an unfun day in your career. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was an unfun day. But I think about it, and if he'd have done it five years before he did it, I'd have left the company. Why? Because five years before, I was in pain and hurt people, hurt people, right? We said that earlier. And uh, so I ended up, uh, you know, five years before, I'd gone through a divorce. And then my ex decided to move back to her hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. And with her went my six-year-old son and two-year-old daughter. I live in Fort Worth, Texas, so I'm separated by a 1,000 miles from my children. And it, it, it ripped my heart out. It really shredded me. And all I knew how to do was stuff it. So stuffing it, by the way, is like taking an inflated beach ball and holding it underwater, expecting it to never come back up. But it always comes back up. And so about 10 months into being separated from my kids, one day I'm combing my hair, getting ready for work. And the next second, I'm on the floor bawling my eyes out. I missed my kids. I missed my kids. I missed them with everything inside of me. And I, on the inside, I look more like a porcupine than a person. And I wanted to, you know, I recognize that if I didn't do something about it, um, I was going to screw my career up. I mean, would you agree with me that, that uh, pain, when pain gets on us, uh, especially from home, it, it can mess our career up. Well, just like pain at work can mess our home life up. Pain doesn't care what side of the fence it gets on. It just gets on. And I remember I needed a shift. I needed to change something. And so I began to, to look for tools and I, and I found this tool and I was blown away by, you know, um, presidents of companies shouldn't scream and yell at employees in front of um, Nokia's international leadership team and a hundred thousand people, but he did. And I needed to reframe that reality. Now, I'll be honest, my first thought would have put me in jail, but the second thought went like this. I paused and I walked away and I asked myself, what's the truth here? And when I realized what the truth was, my first thought, I have to admit, was that I remembered this guy had four months left before he retired and I went, sweet, I'll celebrate his retirement, his absence. But then... I realized what he had just done to him, his own reputation with Nokia. He had screamed at them, I'm a butthead. And uh, if you're the largest manufacturer of cellular phones in the world, do you have options on who you do business with? Yes. And they exercised theirs. They separated from him like that and just ran from him. I mean, they just pfft, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And I thought, wow, look at that. You create your own hell. And it, I didn't have to beat myself up. But he, even beyond that, you know, I had to reframe the reality what is. This guy thought that management training was to verbally abuse you until you were tough enough to lead like him. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with him and his way of expressing himself. He declared himself to be a butthead and I didn't have to, to, to beat myself up. But some of us, when this brick happens and hits us, we go off on this thing I like to call the hamster wheel of the mind and we spin out. We'll literally spend 30 to 40% of our time and attention over there thinking about why they did that, da, 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 all these things, you know, we're spinning out. But at work, especially, they pay you for 100% of your attention, right? And you're only going to give them. 70% or maybe 60%. And what does that mean? It means that you're going to have a hard time with that one because then your stress level goes up and then your error rate goes up and somebody else comes along and they poke you. And because you're so bruised from the last brick that hits you, you, um, yeah, you pop like something out of Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. Yeah. 
So what we need to do is have a process, and here's the process that I want to show you. Because when somebody offends you, we got to forgive them. Now, a lot of people hate that word. They're like, I don't want to let them off the hook. Eh, forgiveness has nothing to do with that. Forgiveness has everything to do with letting you go. You see, I could have carried around what Don did to me. I've had other people do things far worse. And I could carry it around and it will wear me out. Or I can release it and let myself go from that pain. Many of us never do this because we're so afraid of um, that they won't get their just due. And, and I'll just tell you, people always get their just due. They always do. Uh, it always comes back. So here you have to identify the offender and the offense, recreate the pain, choose to forgive, say the name of the offense, and then just say the words I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard to say the word, right? But when you do, it creates it. And I really mean speak it. You want to say, I forgive Don for doing what he did to me. I forgive, you know, my ex for moving up north. I forgive. And these different things that, that you have to release. And what's sad, hard, and the only hard part about this is it isn't usually instantaneous. It usually is a process that you have to do over and over and over and over and over again until the, the process actually works itself through the system, through your system. And then what's amazing is, is that the result is peace. When there's no more charge on it, when you've let it go and you've re released it, there's peace that begins to fill your heart and, and you're able to move on in your life and become who you're supposed to be. Now, when you look at um, fear, fear comes from a rejection. And here's an interesting diagram for you. If you think about a time in your life where rejection was high, do you know what you felt? When rejection was high, like you just got laid off or you just had, got fired or you just went through a, a, a breakup, did you feel fear? Or can you think of a, another moment in your life where you felt acceptance was really high? Um, maybe it's a, a time in your life where your son or your daughter says, Mommy, Daddy, I, I think you're amazing. I'm a hero. And did you feel loved? Now, I know that some people will sit there and say, Oh, wait a minute, Pat. Um, <laughs> the opposite of love is what? And I always hear the same word, hate. And I go, no, 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 you, you should listen to this little green guy who says fear leads to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to suffering. <laughs> yeah, I am that nerdy that I could quote Yoda. Anyways, the point is, is that the process is acceptance. One of the biggest things about healing is that who do we usually reject um, the most? Well, usually it's ourselves. We reject ourselves the most. And that's tough. I mean, that's tough. Uh, our internal critic usually focuses on every error, the error that we ever made. And they blow it up and make it really big. But I'd encourage you to write four words down. Like best. And next time. Like best. L-I-K-E best. And next time. And maybe the next time you do finish a project, you know, what I like best about this project is I got it done on time and under budget. And next time, I'd like to get it done a little early so I can get it checked for accuracy, send it over to marketing, they'll create a nice PowerPoint. And then, you know, but anytime you, you're evaluating yourself and even others, I mean, if you've ever been evaluated like this, where somebody comes up to you and says, you know, ain't or view time, me. Pat, you're 99% everything you do is amazing, but there's this 1%. Most people tend to look at that 1% for the next year. But you see what you focus on expands so that 1% can go to 3%, can go to 5%, and it can do it just systematically and it keeps expanding. Why don't we focus on the good stuff and then we can do better? Um, I, I love to teach a, a, a 
speaker skills class and and when I do I videotape people and you know video record them and and then we when we evaluate it the only thing that anybody's allowed to say is what they did right no matter what happened what they did right is all that we're allowed to say not what they did wrong not even once because what do you want to expand the good stuff or the bad stuff the good stuff and start focusing on that and then the other thing is is to create some affirmations um, I, I I love to listen to um, certain people, uh, I, I, um, Jack Canfield's one I listen to every day. He has a, an audio series called Self Esteem and Peak Performance. And in it, track nine is just affirmations. And I listen to those every morning for about 30 minutes. Because in the morning and the evening, the, the la first and last 30 minutes of the day, the, the unconscious mind is the closest to the surface. Either it's taken a step back in the morning or a step up in the evening, but it's the closest to be trained. And our unconscious mind takes about 90 days to train. And then it's best to continue to rinse and repeat. See, one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Zig Ziglar. And he says, you're what you are and where you are today because of what's gone into your mind. If you want to change what you are, and where you are, you have to change what goes into your mind. And in, in 2005, I got to work with him as one of his speakers. And he said, Pat, you got to rinse and repeat enough on anything to get it past the conscious mind into the unconscious mind. Because the lasting change comes from the unconscious, not the conscious. We know what to do. We always do what we know to do. If you begin to pour into your life things that are healthy, affirming, kind, every day, what begins to happen is your internal critic, that dial begins to shift. And what happens is that after about 90 days of doing this, there's this massive change that's happening where you actually begin to love yourself and appreciate who you are, and then you have more for others. Most people never take this step because their horse wants them to say the same, that, that unconscious man, it wants you to stay the same. And also they're afraid to sound like a narcissist, and you'll never become a narcissist. You're just going to get healthy on you. You see, most people don't like themselves much. And so what happens is, is that when um, uh, mistakes happen, they beat themselves up and, and, and they never see the incredible power that you actually can walk in when you accept yourself. And, and so what happens is we get into a relationship and if you don't like yourself much, what do you give away in the relationship? Sad part is what you give away is manipulation. Because you give to get, you give to get, you give to get. And what happens when you give and you don't get a 50 plus percent divorce rate? Let's love ourselves, accept who we are. And that'll change your world. It'll give you confidence. It'll give you strength. It'll give you so much more if we just move in that direction. And I acknowledge that most people won't do that. Their horse says, stay the same. And I go, okay, stay the same. But for the few that take the, the, that challenge and begin to pour into themselves something affirming, wow, you begin to love yourself and you begin to be free to become who you're supposed to be. And I encourage that. I really do. And then the, the last area that we're going to go into is sadness. And sadness comes from a loss. And losses have to be grieved. And the stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, just to tell you a little story about this, I, years ago when I first began to see this information and learn it, within about six months I was teaching it and um, on a, in a three-day event. And I began to um, really uh, change everything in the way that I, I uh, uh, worked with others. And I had a great mentor. I had a great mentor. And um, her name was Susan Allman. She was amazing. And when I was, uh, I'd been a director for about three years with Susan. And Susan was the most amazing mentor ever. And we got really good at teaching this class together. We were like dueling banjos. You know, we just co-teach. We just didn't care who was supposed to be up. And we would work on that stuff uh, in between these weekends. We would have three or four weeks usually between the weekend. And we'd be talking and we'd be emailing. And we'd be, you know, when I went over to Dallas to do this thing, I would stay with her. And, and uh, you know, my wife and uh, I would stay with her. And, and we would, you know, stay up late talking. And, and it was just an amazing encounter to have her in my life. 
and and so, as you see, we're teaching. I'm teaching a thing that has to do with really processing pain rather than running from it. And so one Friday morning of a of a, one of these weekends, I get a phone call. And about 11 o'clock in the morning, and the phone call goes like this, Pat, we need to let you know that Susan passed away last night. My mentor, my best friend had passed away. And what was the first thing I said was, no way. No. But that didn't work very well. And, and I didn't really get angry, I have to admit that. I, because she passed away in the night. I didn't know she had a heart condition for a while, but, you know. Bargaining, no chips, can't raise the dead. Splash, right there, depression. Right there. Just splash. And, and I had to go teach that weekend. Teach this in the weekend, starting that night. And I'm thinking, how am I going to make it? And then I realized that, you know what? Um, Susan had 18 other trainers she was the mentor for. 18. And I'm supposed to lead those folks as now the senior director for a program on how to process pain. And it was tough. I mean, I'm thinking about how am I going to do this? And when I was on my way over there um, to the, the location, it was about an hour drive for me. And so on the way, I was thinking about every moment, every minute, every email, every lesson, every thing that Susan had taught me and that I'd received from her in the last three years of her being in my life. And I was so grateful. And, and in my mind, I took every moment and lesson and, and, and I just converted them into diamonds in my mind. And, and cause I see in pictures, you know, and, and all of a sudden I remember in my mind, I, I looked down and I was hip high in diamonds. And I remember scooping them up in my mind and just holding them there and thinking, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was so grateful for every moment, every diamond of wisdom and, and time that I had received from, from Susan. And, and, and I, I went and helped the folks that weekend. And I taught my trainers to do the same. And we just said, every time we think of Susan, we're going to be grateful. And we made it through the weekend. And we were able to go from depression to acceptance really fast. See, most people, they get into depression. And how long can you stay in depression? Usually, it's about as long as your medications are paid for. I mean, you know, we got to move to to acceptance. And this one tool, this one insight, I just, you know, really just give it to you and say, when you have a loss, convert those things into lessons and diamonds that you can be grateful for, even though there may be a massive pain there for the loss of that person. But I encourage you to be grateful for every moment, every lesson, and look for those things. For sometimes, sometimes the loss is so great, so tremendous that we may have to do, you know, we may have to do another process. But uh, if it's a loss of a child or, or, you know, maybe a spouse or something, but even then, whether it's a child or spouse, I encourage you to look at what's, what you received while they were in your presence and, and turn that around. Because I remember a few years later, my own mother passed away and, and we were there at the end, uh, all except for the last five minutes. We stepped out. We thought she was going to make it through the night. So we were on our way home and we got the phone call a few minutes later. And I remember I just went, I mean, I love my mom, but I said, thanks. And I just made, I had these piles of diamonds that my mom had given me. And I, I didn't really have to go through so much grief. So I encourage you, do, walk through the process. Don't be afraid of the pain. Um, you, sometimes we can medicate ourselves into oblivion. Don't. Take, walk through, walk through the process. Because the end of the process is joy. And what's so amazing is that peace, love, joy, they're, these are fruit. They're not gifts. Fruit are grown. Gifts are given. Fruit are great to have. Peace, joy, love, long-suffering, patience, kind of. You know, those are, fruit, those are great to have. Usually you just have to walk through hell to get them. And, uh, and 
they're the things that really make a difference in others' lives. See, one of the things I can tell you is that the stuff we go through is meant to be um, a message to set others free. The things that we go through are designed to be a tool, a message to set others free. And I, I hope that you've gotten some, some good value out of this and enjoyed this, this little uh, training. And uh, I hope you use it. I really do. I encourage you. Follow the process and you become free. Thanks for watching tonight. This is Pat Dewar. If you want to learn more about me, go to my YouTube channel, uh, Patrick Dewar, uh, D-O-U-G-H-E-R. Also, you can email me. Um, and uh, I think I actually put those up here. No, I didn't. Okay. So with that, I'll just say thanks for sharing, for being here today. And I will see you next time.